this is my clicker. Right. Thank you so much, Christopher, and thanks to Charles and Christopher uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, and thanks for coming out on the 4th of July, uh, the, the on-ramp to vacation. Um, I was really excited by the invitation to come present today because of the interest in sort of creating dialogue and thinking across different forms of knowledge. Um, and I expect to learn a lot today um, as much as I hope to share some of my own work with you. Um, because people often don't know that much about ancient um, Greek medicine, biology, philosophy, I'm going to spend a little bit more time um, in the talk today presenting um, some background. And so I will talk about Aristotle, I'll talk about Galen and the Stoics, but a little bit, um, I'm going to have to cut down a little bit on that in order to sort of give you the, the broad picture. Um, the big question I think I have to answer for you at the outset um, is why are we talking about the ancient Greeks uh, in the history of genomics? Um, genomics and biology more broadly, the ancient Greeks are a long way away. And I could give you answers about either um, origin stories or thinking about historical atavism and what we've sort of uh, transcended. And, and I want to instead look at the kind of specific relationship of ancient Greek to the history of vitalism. So vitalism, ah! <laughs> Wow, My goodness. it's a very agential computer. Okay, um, huh. it's a strange kind of uh, historical object. So in a famous essay by George Cungiam, who Charles Wolfe's gonna talk about later, he talks about how vitalism is unlike other kinds of objects in the history of science because it sort of refuses to die. So it kind of keeps coming back and it has a persistence and a vitality he talks about. Um, and so it defies obsolescence in a way, it defies transcendence. And if you think about vitalism as an object which is suspended between history on the one hand, the progress of time and philosophy as a sort of problems we keep grappling with, the Greeks occupy a very important role historically in how vitalism has been organized as this trans-historical problem, this recurrent historical problem. Now, the claim about the Greeks' importance uh, at the sort of origins of this tradition does not necessarily have to be a claim about absolute origins. So there are difficulties that I'm not going to get into today about the story Kangiam and many other philosophers of the 20th century would tell you about the role of the Greeks as sort of the moment where human subjects sort of come into themselves as thinking object, you know, thinking subjects um, that didn't happen in any other culture. And before that, we sort of weren't really human. That's not the claim that I'm making today. Um, as we do more comparative philosophy, we think more broadly about the ancient world. That's simply an untenable claim. That's not the claim I'm making. What I am claiming is that if we're thinking about vitalism as a tradition of thinking, as a philosophical sort of conversation that takes place across time, we're really thinking about how it sort of manifests itself in texts that people write and then return to and comment on and come back to and debate with over many, many centuries. So we're talking about a sort of material tradition, text as a technology for transmitting ideas across time. And within this trans-historical tradition of conversation, the Greeks occupy an exceptionally important role. So the texts that are written, the names that are associated with those texts, Hippocrates, Aristotle, Galen, become consistent points of reference within the history of vitalism all the way up to the 20th century. And so that's the way in which I'm thinking about the Greeks. On the other hand, um, what I'm doing today is I'm not going to go back, I'm not going to assume that, that vitalism is something we should defend or validate. I'm not going to go back to the Greeks and say, look, everybody else has gone back to them. I'm going to go back to them too. Instead, what I want to do is sort of um, in the spirit of vitalism as this trans-historical sort of exercise, I want to go back to um, a handful of Greek sources to think about the emergence of philosophical problems that get sort of worked again and again and again, and to think about them as both sort of resonant with philosophical problems that we haven't sort of solved in thinking about bodies and nature and life, but they're also quite different. Um, and so one thing uh, is soul, right? Soul is not a concept that most scientists are gonna be talking about today. So there's this interesting thing when we think about the Greek material where it looks both familiar and unfamiliar, and it's a good exercise as we try to sort of develop our conceptual resources to think with the Greeks. And so that's the experiment that I think has been happening over the history of vitalism, and that's what I want to do with you today. And I've got two main questions that I want to work through, and they're big questions, and, and I'm raising them. Um, uh, and I want to show sort of how they create certain traditions in the ancient Greek material. One is... 
does an account of life require unity? One of the things that we see when we get to Aristotle in particular, but also post-Aristotelian thinkers, is an obsession with unity. Life is a unity. Living substances are unities. It's a, a whole greater than the sum of its parts. It's a recurrent theme in vitalism. And the second question I want to ask is, how does this demand for unity come into conflict with different ways in which this thing we're calling life expresses itself? So those are sort of the two. I'm sort of watching how unity emerges as a, as a solution or as a sort of desideratum, something you want to achieve. And then I'm looking at how, in fact, that's a really hard thing to achieve, um, unity. So I've got three parts. And, um, and I just want to give you a sense since people, and I put my bust of Aristotle up there so you know we're in Greece. Um, so in the beginning, I want to sort of look at the prehistory of, of this two soul, what I'm calling the two soul problem in Aristotle. So I want to re kind of retrace what I would call the emergence of, of the problem of life and the problem of the body. But I'll move over that relatively quickly, given the amount of material I'm going to cover, just to give you the background. Then I want to focus on, on Aristotle. And then I really want to also, I want to, even if I don't get to do a lot with the Stoics and Galen, I really want to look at them because a lot of times what happens when we go back to the Greeks is we pick a thinker like Aristotle and then we assume that, you know, I mean, it's great. We can have a conversation with Aristotle. We can think about Aristotle. We forget the fact that there was an enormously sophisticated engagement with Aristotle in antiquity that's very valuable to us as we engage with many of the problems that Aristotle raised. So that's why I want to make sure that I, I look at some of these later thinkers. A couple of things I want to point out. This is a huge span of time. I'm talking about a much greater span of time than I'm sure anybody else today. So 750 to 2, I mean, 1,000 years, essentially, right? Um, I'm talking about both physicians and philosophers. That's an important thing about the history of vitalism, the history of life, is we're constantly tacking back and forth between conceptual speculative work and not just pragmatic work, I mean, not just empirical science, but really thinking about life as an object of care and something you have to develop techniques for to take care of. And that's something that creates a little bit of this tension between different forms of, of life, uh, life's agency. Um, and the third thing that I want to point out is that what I had said earlier about talking about a tradition of a problem as being instantiated textually, materially, this is very much the case. So particularly when we get to the Hippocratics and we get to Plato, we're watching the emergence of a body of text, a corpus of text, that later thinkers are going to go back to again and again and again. They're going to keep reading and keep questioning that body of text. So that is instantiated already in antiquity, that, that material embodiment of a way of thinking through problems. So I want to start with a claim that the philosopher Bernard Williams makes um, in order to sort of raise this question of body and soul. Okay, so we think we're, uh, we're in the world of the body. We think that the alternative is something like soul or something like mind. Well, what kind of a problem is this? How does it, how does it come about? So, so Williams makes this claim. Uh, we do indeed have a concept of the body. We agree that each of us has a body. We do not all agree we each have a soul. Soul is, in a sense, more speculative or theoretical concept of body. So this is Williams's claim. And I want to start by, uh, and this is a lot of uh, philosophers, a lot of people thinking about the history of, of dualism, would make a claim like this. The problem is not the body. The body is given. The problem is when we start thinking about soul or mind or these kinds of speculative ideas. So is a concept of the body innate? Is it universal? Is body such a given idea? The second question, what is he talking about when he talks about soul? So he assumes that body is given. And once you assume body is sort of static and given, you're just automatically going to have this thing called soul. Well, what is soul? Um, and, and what is the soul that's at stake in the text that I'm looking at? And then the third question, what is it that makes a concept speculative or theoretical? So what if I framed it like this? We all agree we're, we're all alive. Does that mean that life is not a speculative concept? Okay, so there's really this question of what's built into the very positing of something speculative or theoretical. So I put these questions up here because I disagree with Williams, and I want to walk through first, uh, I want to challenge this question of the concept of the body being innate or universal, and then I'll talk a little bit about soul, and then we'll open into how a particular formation of the body-soul problem creates what I'm calling the two-soul problem. So Snell, or, or Williams is actually responding to um, a very famous book, which was written in the mid 20th century by Bruno Snell, which you may know, called The Discovery of the Mind. 
And Snell made a claim, actually, that, that it had been, been noticed already in antiquity, um, but Snell returns to it, um, that he looks at the evidence from, from Homer, and he notices um, one thing in particular, the first, the first line on there, which is um, the word that means body in the tradition going forward. So every text that I talk about from, from basically once we get past Homer, when, when, I see, when you see body, the Greek word is soma, this word does not appear in Homer to designate the living body. The body is, the soma is always dead in Homer. And in fact, it's not the usual word that, that the Homeric poets would have used to talk about the dead body. They have other words, necros, nekush, that they use. Soma is a very weird word. And then there's a second thing that you can notice, which is psyche, the word from which we get psychology, is also absent as life force or as mind or as anything it's going to come to mean in the later tradition. So psyche in Homer also has to do with death, and it's a sort of slip, this little wisp that, that um, arises out of the corpse. You can see um, vase paintings where like the psyche sort of hovers over the corpse at death and sort of just disappears, and, and that's the, the only sort of manifestation of the psyche. The other interesting thing is not only does soma not mean living body in Homer, there's no other word that we could pick out which would sort of match the, the semantic feel that gets attached to soma later on. Similarly, there's nothing that you could attach to psyche. So there's no obvious um, dualism in Homer, we could say. There's a ton of other words to talk about human embodiment. So there's two ways of taking this evidence. So Snell's claim is that Homer lacked a unified self. So if you don't have a notion of the soul, he thinks you can't really have a notion of the body as not soul. And you can't, and this is interesting because this is going to recur, you can't really have a unified notion of, of the self. He, the Homeric self is just a sort of collection of limbs and organs and things like that. So the Greeks on, on Snell's um, reading are going to discover this unified notion of the self. They're going to discover the mind. It's very Hegelian. And they're going to sort of progress on this path of which we're the, her the heirs today. And thank God we're not Greeks. OK. Um, the second way of taking this piece of information is to say, OK, what in Homer we have is a, a way of thinking about embodiment, what we would call embodiment in selves, which does not map onto the way that we are accustomed to do it, where we sort of divide everyone into bodies and souls. Um, and that's interesting because it means, first of all, there are other ways of imagining selves as embodied. But the other thing that's interesting is then, where does it come from? So the Greeks do have a notion of body and soul. Let's watch how it sort of emerges. So, if we look on the soul side, which is where people have been interested mostly, we have to deal primarily with fragments. We have very little evidence um, for the soul before the corpus of Plato in the fourth century. So people latch on to a few fragments. So one of them is a fragment of Pythagoras. You probably know the, the Pythagorean theorem in mathematics, but Pythagoras is also primarily associated with metapsychosis and eschatology. So eschatology, the life of the soul after death, and, uh, and metempsychosis, the idea that souls can travel from one body to another. So I put a dog up there. This fragment B4 is supposedly about Pythagoras um, watching someone beat a dog and saying, don't beat, I think I hear in the cries of the dog the voice of a friend, so that the soul of a friend is in the dog. So that metempsychosis is, is one way of imagining the soul as a more robust concept than just this kind of little cloud that emerges at death. Another really important moment is, uh, are the fragments of Heraclitus. So these are the 6th century BC, roughly, into the early 5th, where you get some fragments that suggest that the soul might be the locus of thought or mind or cognition. So people get very excited about these, but there's only a couple of them. And then there's ideas about the soul as a kind of life force. So we have these fragments that people have put a lot of effort into telling a story about as the beginning of the Greeks discovering mind and soul and all of the rest. Um, and we can't, there's something we say as classes, we say, you know, it's difficult to ever, um, you know, what we would say is, is absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So if I say it's difficult to attribute a lot to these fragments, we also have to recognize that just because we may not have the evidence to tell a better story, but too much, in, uh, too much weight has been given to these little 
bits of evidence, in part just because we think the soul is more important. What if we think about the body, the thing that was given and an object was given? If we think about the history of the body, it turns out we have a ton of evidence. We have 60 treatises, roughly 60 treatises from the 5th century that get gathered under the name of Hippocrates. I'll talk about them within the Hippocratic Corpus. We don't know which of them were written by Hippocrates. They date from about the second half of the 5th century to the beginning of the 4th century. So if we look at these texts, we can see that a notion of what I call the physical body is not at all a given. It's very much conceptual. So the physical body would be, and this is what it's going to be really throughout the tradition that we're looking at over the next few days, a body, a soma with a physis, with a nature. And we'll talk about what a nature is. But the idea that the Greeks create a notion of the body with a nature recurs. It recurs in the Greco-Arabic translator. It recurs in the early uh, European sources. This is what defines the body, not secular, but as, as a physical body, a body with a nature. So what defines this body? So it's a, it's a body with a nature, and it's made up of different stuffs, which we, get, we come to know as humors. And these themselves have humors. And these, the, because you have natures, they're predictable, and they're subject to control. The physical body is an object of specialized knowledge. So it's not something of which we all have an intuitive concept. It's not something which we can all intuitively control. So there's two important aspects of the physical body as it emerges as a concept within medicine. The first is that its nature is largely hidden. So there's an idea, they get very interested in the idea that there's an interior now to the self which cannot be accessed, cannot be seen, and which only produces symptoms. And only doctors know how to read this information. The other thing that they're very interested in is that the things that control what happens there and in our embodied experience are these forces, things with natures, that are not continuous, continuous with our own sense of agency. I can't will the bile in my body to do certain things. So there's a break in the body now between a form of what we could call impersonal agency that in previous ways of explaining disease might have been attributed to the gods. Now it's inside the self. And then there's this person with cognition and emotion and perception, which these faculties can be used to understand the natures of the things operating inside. But these natures of, say, the humors can only be operated on technically. So there's a split that's introduced with the idea of the physical body that will come back to us. Another thing that's really crucial about this concept of the physical body is that it's susceptible to suffering. We'll come back to this idea. It's, it's a volatile object, and so it requires care. And the last bit that we see in these texts is that if I can give an account in terms of the body, in terms of the soma, uh, that may be sufficient to explain every aspect of human experience. So we understand this as a reductive position. And in some ways, we could say that the way that the body emerges in the Hippocratic corpus is reductive. If you think that there was a sort of plurality of ways of explaining human experience in life and our ability to do all kinds of things prior to this. Um, but in other ways, oops, we might... Um, we might think that reductivism already presumes the notion of soul or mind. Um, and what I want to say is actually the reverse is true. We begin with the Hippocratic corpus with a very robust attempt to give an account of life and human experience in terms of the body and the body's nature. And it provokes a response. And that response is, is that all there is? Really? Is that all there is? Is the body sufficient to give an account of life and human experience. And so the thing, the soul that I'm interested in, the soul that is going to be relevant to what we talk about in the next, the rest of this talk, is really a soul that's produced in response to perceived insufficiencies in the body as an explanatory mechanism for human life and human experience, and, and life and also understood more broadly, plant life, animal life, so on and so forth. So there are two ways in which this response, is that all there is, gets articulated in the fourth century primarily. The first is in Plato. So most people would know or would assume, you know, Plato doesn't like the body. He's the first somatophobe in history. Um, and we often will start the story with Plato. But we have to think, well, what is Plato responding to? So Plato is responding to the incredible cultural authority of medicine at the beginning of the fifth century. He's, ex he's, he's responding to the incredible sort of um, prestige of this cultural institution, but also the incredible power of its explanatory mechanisms. And he stands up and says, um, no, the body is not all there is. There's another part of ourselves, and we're going to call it 
soul, psuche. And we're going to make this psuche not just a sort of interesting speculative object, but it is itself an object of care. Now, if we were going to get into the weeds, we could say Socrates was really the first to say this. One of the most famous things he says in the, the Apology, so Plato's dialogue, which pur pur purports to reproduce Socrates' speech on his trial for death in 399, Socrates says, what did I do? Like, what did I do in Athens? I went around asking you to take care of your souls. So very early on and in the early Platonic dialogues, you get this idea that the soul is different from the body and it's itself an object of care. But also, this is attached to the idea, if it's an object of care, then there needs to be a techne. There needs to be an art or a science, a form of knowledge. Not, you know, it's not something we can just know to take care of our soul. We need to have ethics. We need to have philosophy, like medicine, to teach us how to take care of this particular object. And not only is it different from the body, but it's also the most important part of ourselves. So this is the next thing that Plato and Socrates will say, is that uh, Plato has this really great scene in the Republic where Socrates talks about the elite. So his, who's his audience, right, his elite Athenians? He says, you know, all the elites are going around and they're obsessed with every little symptom. They think they're sick all the time. You know, they, they can't even focus. They read and they say that reading is making them sick. It's not healthy for them. And so he's really saying, you know, they're just completely um, hypochondriacs and they need to be caring for their souls. They're looking at the wrong part of themselves. The soul is the real self. Right? So this is not just a claim about difference. It's a claim about priority. Who has the priority um, claim about the self? But the soul is also subject to its own pathology. So this is the rub of the, what we call the medical analogy. The medical analogy says the soul is different. And that's why there's an analogy. But it's sufficiently similar that we can think about it having pathologies that are similar to those of the body. So this is one way in which the soul gets put forward as something separate, but on analogy with the body. The second is um, what we start to see in the fourth century in medical texts themselves. And this is really, really important as well to the history of vitalism and thinking about Hippocrates as a kind of origin point for vitalism. So in the fourth, in the fifth century, we largely see the body as something which needs help. It needs care. It's primarily thought of in terms of the humors, in terms of fluids, as something that has to be controlled. Um, and so it's, this, it's a quote from the Republic, you know, what, is it enough for a body to be a body? No, it needs medicine. And then you start to get this idea, which is, is put forward most clearly in a, in a fourth century text called Epidemic 6. It says nature is uh, untaught. So in fact, the body's nature is the physician, the disease. And so what you're really starting to look at is how is it that in disease, if without medicine, bodies still get better? What is this thing that controls the body? Uh, and that thing is called nature. So I put that forward because it's going to come back as, as a kind of competitor to soul within the tradition. So I want to turn now to Aristotle. And Aristotle is himself embedded in this tradition. He's responding to Plato, and he has his own account of what a human being is in terms of soma and psuche. A living thing is a partnership of the body and the soul, just as in Plato. Um, but there are going to be some important differences with Plato. Now, um, the first thing that I want to point out is that if we think about soma and psuche for Aristotle, we really have to think about his broader ontology. So an ontology is just what, what do you think exists in the world? What is, like, what is the kind of furniture of the world? And for Aristotle, there are two things primarily uh, to think about. One is matter, hule, and the other is morphos, form. And so hule is uh, not body. It's something broader than body, but it's the analog of body at a sort of um, metaphysical or, or broad scale level. Oh, I put a statue, I didn't actually, <laughs> I put that statue not like praying to Aristotle's ontology, but because hule comes from the Greek word for timber. And the paradigm for thinking about the hule morphe relationship is a statue. So we look at the bronze statue, we say its material is bronze or its material is wood, and it has a form put on it. And so living things have to be, be understood hulomorphically, um, which is to say uh, in terms of their matter, their body, and their form. And in fact, many people would argue that living things are the primary things that Aristotle is trying to explain by his ontology. So what is soul? What is this thing form? What is it meant to do? 
for Aristotle. Um, Aristotle has some important differences from Plato. I'm going to come back to them in just a moment, but let's look at his sort of, this is like really rough um, and, and ready, but uh, I want to look quickly at what, what his claim about soul. So soul is form. Um, but more specifically, in the De Anima on the soul, he says the soul is the first entelecheia, the first actuality of an organic, natural body. So what is an entelecheia? Well, entelecheia already looks to the fact that when we're talking about a living substance, a form is never static. It's not a statue. A statue is made and it just sits there. A living being requires a form that's going to be dynamic and it's going to have to maintain itself despite the fact that it's constantly exchanging matter with the outside world. So entelecha means that, that uh, an ensouled body has an activity, and that activity is life. Soul, things with souls have life in Aristotle. So a natural body uh, possesses life for Aristotle if it has within itself its own processes of nourishment, growth, and decay. So the bottom sort of rung of the ladder for life which is a step up from having a nature, is being able to maintain your own form dynamically in time, to take responsibility for the maintenance of a life in time. What is an organic natural body? So this word organic, we use it a lot. What does it mean for Aristotle? He's really the first to use it in this capacity. An organon in Greek is a tool. An organic body and it retains the sense through Leibniz. I think it's, someone else can talk more about that. But it's, it's the, the way it start, it's introduced with Aristotle, an organic body is a body that is used by the soul in order to carry out its main activity, which is life. Now, what is Aristotle trying to get at um, with this notion of soul? What is he responding to? So we can say he's responding to two problems. Um, one is to go back to the question of materialism or using the body or matter to give a fully explanatory uh, an explanation of nature. So in this sense, he's still fighting the battle that we could say Plato is giving an account, uh, trying to fight, right? Like, what is this thing that we can posit that will explain life um, that matter can't explain it? But Aristotle adds something really important for the later history of vitalism, which is the problem with materialist explanations is they can't make a one out of many. They can't make a whole out of a heap. So materialism can't explain what, what contemporary philosophers of parts and wholes, you, know, you can't give a myriological explanation, you can't explain structure. And so a living unity has a problem with parthood in two ways that soul is going to have to solve. One is they're made up of multiple parts. So I love this word, I had to put it in here, they're not myriological atoms. A myriological atom is something like Parmenidean being, where it has no parts, no proper parts, considering itself can't be a part. So a myriological atom is just pure oneness. Living unities are not pure oneness. They have parts, I have all different, I have this, the, my arms, my limbs, my tissues, I have so many different parts. So how am I gonna unify that? How is soul gonna unify that? Um, and the second thing that I've talked about is they have to sustain unity over time despite the exchange of matter. So Aristotle introduces soul to address these two challenges to unity. Soul is going to do two things. It's going to impose a single purpose, a telos. This is where we get the word teleology on all the parts. All the parts are going to be oriented towards this one goal, and that is life. That this, and the soul is what does that. And so that purpose is imminent in every single part at every single moment. So we could call that a kind of synchronic unity. The second thing soul is going to do is just maintain diachronic unity. So it's going to ensure that when I take in food and I convert whatever that food is into me, uh, that, that, that what it's converted into is in accordance with the unity. So we could say that soul's second purpose is to recruit new matter to become part of the unity that is the single life of, of, of a living form, a, a given nature. So that's Aristotle's first hope for soul, is to impose a unity that he thinks a body cannot supply. A, a body is too fluid, too messy, too multiple, to account for how a life has a form of structure and unity. The second thing Aristotle is trying to do is he's actually fighting against Plato. So he's not just responding to materialism, he's responding to Plato. And he's got two beefs against Plato. The first is that Plato himself seems to advocate for a form of metempsychosis. So the idea that, that souls travel from one body to another, he puts this forward in the Timaeus. 
The second problem, which is in some ways uh, equally important for us today, is that Plato, as we could see, is a somatophobe. He doesn't like the body, and he thinks that the body is subject, like basically all the body's pro or the soul's problems, sorry, are because it's in a body. A body is embedded in the material world. Things are going to and fro. The soul is constantly fighting to impose its own order, but the body is constantly disrupting that. And um, so Aristotle uh, is responding to these two ideas with two solutions. So one is the idea of fit, right? So that's where the organic body really gets. This is where you can see why he needs the organic body. He says, he has this great moment in the Dianima where he says, none of my predecessors have given an account of the koinonia, the partnership of the body and soul. You can't just take Brooke's soul and put it in a dog. It doesn't work that way because a dog is not suited to be Brooke. So there has to be a partnership. There has to be an adaptability. And that's why the body and soul are so closely in partnership. You can't even separate them in the mind. The second thing he says is that the soul is of such a thing that it's not material and it can't be affected by the body. So when I perceive, it's not that like things are impacting me and the soul as a material body is affected, that something kind of magical happens and my capacity to perceive is turned on. So he restores the idea that the soul is sort of protected from the material flux of the body. It has, he wants to protect its sort of agency. Um, and therefore it can use the body. It's not used by the body. So this is where we're gonna get the two soul problem, right? So I've just put out sort of two problems with materialism that Aristotle wants to respond to, but in using soul to solve both those problems, he produces what we could say is a non-unified object. So on the one hand now, we have a soul that imbues the body with a unifying form that's imminent and dynamic, and that's holomorphism. So we could say that in some ways he's taking over what for the physicians is the train of nature. Soul is a life force. Everywhere in my body, at every moment, in every cell, there's something called soul organizing life and one holding me together, um, and that you could never separate out. It's just the form. And the second is the soul is the user of the body. So this is where Aristotle starts to look more like a, a dualist. Like he can't maintain holomorphism. He talks about the soul as something that's localized, it's cognition, it's emotion that uses the body. So Aristotle scholars struggle a lot with this. The, the Aristotle seems to be sometimes when he talks about the soul using the body to perceive, it's really hard to imagine how the soul simply is the form of the body. It seems much more like a, a dualistic relationship again. So we have a kind of holomorphism and an instrumentalist um, account. So what I want to now take, and I'm just going to take another five minutes. I think we started five minutes late. So um, um, I'm just going to take a look very quickly at what happens to this problem of the two souls. So what um, we're going to look at the Stoics and Galen, but just think about the problem as on the one hand, you wanted to, to unify matter, but in unifying matter, you produced two souls is essentially the problem. So one response is the Stoics. The Stoics come along and they say, you know what? A soul is not incorporeal. A soul is a body. It's affected by the body through the form of sympathy. But as in Aristotle, every living thing is a unity. So they become even more obsessed with unity than Aristotle was. The cause of what unifies it is nevertheless going to be material. So they have this idea of something called pneuma or breath, which imbues the entire world and is imminent in all matter and organizes it with form. And pneuma is essentially uh, going to be God or structure or something like that. So we have a very big difference from Aristotle. They're, they're uh, major corporealists, but they run into the same problem because they want to posit unity and they've got kind of two ways of doing that. On the one hand, they're trying to talk about cohesion. How does a body hang together? How, does it, how is it formed? How can we even talk about body as matter? Body is itself already formed before it's ever a tool of the soul. Um, and so on the other hand, they want to talk about how when you have a formed body, there's something, as soon as we get from stones to plants, that has to figure out how to control the processes of nutrition and growth and reproduction and all of the rest. So they start to posit this thing called the hegemonicon, the ruling part. And so um, I'm going to not go there. Um, and so you already, in this kind of difference between cohesion, we can see what Aristotle is doing with the idea of a soul that organizes everything in the body is imminent everywhere versus soul is the locus of cognition 
and mind and emotion and all of these things in a sort of organizing and running the whole operation. Now, they do think that there are two, um, that as you go up the kind of scala nature, the kind of ladder, you have plants will have natures, and that's what organizes in some way cohesion at the level of growth and nutrition, but only animals will have souls. So here's the problem that we see in the Stoics. We want the soul to be the thing that unifies animals. So they make this claim that once an animal is born, soul is the thing that organizes the whole thing as a complex unity. But then they run into this problem is what organizes the non-conscious work of life, the kind of work of cohesion that's going on below the threshold of consciousness, growth, nutrition, reproduction, do we call that soul or do we call that nature? So we call that nature in plants. What do we call it in animals? What do we call it in humans? Can soul extend to cover that part of the self? Or is soul just how we feel and we perceive in our forms of agency? Do we have one soul or two? The problem in the Stoics, who are, both, who are, who are Unitarians, just like Aristotle, comes up. So when you get later antique, uh, antique sources sort of organizing doxographies, ways of thinking out the world, the Stoics are like Aristotle. They think there's a single life, a mia zoe of the soul, but they also talk about the soul in two ways. It's both the thing that holds us together and it's the thing that tells that thing that's been organized what to do. Galen has a similar response, but he goes in a different interesting direction. So I'm gonna close with Galen. He doesn't know what the nature of the soul is. He's an empirical uh, scientist. He's a physician, and he basically says, I can't subject to scientific demonstration uh, experiments on the soul. I don't know. But he's certainly sure that the brain is the ruling part, is responsible for cognition and all the rest. And he's, he's a teleologist. So he thinks that the world is organized. He thinks living beings are organized. And he's very interested in what is this thing that's imminent in living things that organizes them, uh, that allows the plan of the demiurge. He's Aristotelian in that sense. So he's like the Stoics, um, he's got different forms of unity. He's got a cognitive soul that's responsible for mind and our, our emotional faculties and perception. And he's got a kind of vegetal or plant body. The idea of the natural faculties is how the teleological plan becomes imminent in a body. Um, and so he runs into this really interesting problem, and I'll, I'll sort of end with this and then put forth um, just a really quick summary. So unlike Galen, I, I mean, sorry, unlike Aristotle, unlike the Stoics who are obsessed with unity, Galen throws his hands up in this amazing text on, on the formation of the fetus, where he's really struggling with this idea that he says he's worried about his whole life. Like everyone says there's this cause of the formation of the embryo, which is the same thing that keeps our bodies alive without us wanting to keep them alive. He says everyone calls this nature, and nobody knows what it is. So on the one hand, there's this thing called untaught nature that works through us, that organizes our actions and tells us just how to, you know, what's beneficial, what's, what's dangerous, that, that takes care of nutrition. And that's what he calls untaught nature. But then he also says, how is it that even the smallest child can move their arms and it takes me decades as an anatomist to understand what the nerves are and how they connect to the brain. And I mean, you know, how is it that we can move our bodies, but we don't understand them? And so he says, you know what? People have talked about a world soul. People have talked about one soul. They say the rational soul controls everything. He says, I don't believe it because it doesn't know itself. There's a fundamental blindness within the soul that therefore creates a division that Galen sort of struggles with. It says, I can't reconcile the two. So he's quite honest in a way about the impossibility of unity. So essentially the two soul problem is how does a living unity sustain itself as one thing in time given that it's material. And Aristotle says, look, a body is a limited explanatory mechanism. We need structure and we need direction. And soul is going to provide both those things. And we went quickly over Galen and um, and the Stoics, but essentially what I wanted to put forth is they're both reacting to Aristotle's attempt to unify the body with soul and saying actually we need two different ways of explaining how unity is imposed. One starts to look like nature, plant life, vegetality, cohesion, and the other is the cognitive self, um, sensation, perception, this kind of self. Um, and so we have to ask what happens to unity in that picture. 
Okay, I've had one more slide, but it fell out of this version. Um, and so the last thing that I want to say is essentially many of the problems in vitalism, again, they'll come back in Kangam, they come back with this question of how do we rec reconcile technique and the desire to master life, the desire to control life with life's ability to just do its own work, to sort of live on its own. And what we see in the kind of formation of these problems in antiquity is on the one hand, a real push to unity, to say a life is a unified thing. And on the other hand, we see this sort of recognition that technique itself is born out of a blindness of at least animals or complex animals like humans to the life that works within them and the need to sort of constantly be creating technique in order to control um, what isn't automatic. So I'll stop there um, so we have time for questions. And thank you very much for your patience. So questions? OK, Charles. Oh, yeah. So everybody has to speak into a mic. Otherwise, they can't hear us uh, remotely. And Brooke, you have to come back to the mic. Okay. <laughs> it's going to have a, a mic dialogue. I don't think it's, oh, yeah, I it guess is, I have to It is close. indeed on. OK. Um, well, hi, everyone. And thank you for a fantastic talk. I'd, rather than engaging directly with the problem of, you know, the two souls and unity and body, I have sort of two uh, to contribute to some of our, you know, the exchanges or the, the resonances between our interests or our talks or what we talk about here. Uh, two quick things. One is th this fascinating idea that you mentioned that Hippocrates and or the construct called Hippocrates uh, gets to be a kind of perpetually recurring response, alternate option, reaction that one can, you know, play the Hippocrates card. And, you know, some of us here know this story pretty well, not everyone does, and so I'll just quickly say, there's the early modern, there's an early modern version of this, and then there's a sort of 18th century, late 18th century version of it, which I've worked on, but, and in the early modern case, it's interesting because the prestige of what some people call scientific revolution science, so mechanistic science, is, is great, it's a huge prestige. But then you have these people saying, oh, you know, I poo-poo your, your funnels and pulley, pulleys and sieves and, you know, your mechanistic approach to the body. I'm with the great Hippocrates. And so it sounds archaic, but then it's we, what used to be called postmodern. It's deliberately archaic as a way of trying to be um, uh, um, ultra-modern. And so that's one thing where there's a, as you know very well, this gets perpetually played out again. And even, it's not an aspect I've ever looked at very closely, but even in Conguillem's own complicated interaction with the problem of mechanism and machines. It's similarly, again, it's like, well, I don't really want to fully sign away everything to some kind of mechanistic authority. And I too am going to advert or allude to Hippocrates. The second thing, so similarly, is that it just, I've never thought of this resonance till, till listening to you. Vitalism in the mid to late 18th century in its first perhaps branded existence, you know, its existence bearing the name vitalism, Montpellier School of Medicine, France, which I won't talk about, especially in my talk, but that form of vitalism is kind of beautifully symmetrically sandwiched or caught between two soul obsessions. Because on the one hand, uh, Stahl, so uh, early 18th century, important figure in medicine, medical theory, et cetera, et cetera, is soul obsessed. Uh, strong explanatory appeals to the role of the soul in the body, strong appeals to, well, to Aristotle and others. And the, these people who come one or two generations after him, these vitalists, are trying to push back, they're trying to roll back some of this soul centrism or presence of a strong metaphysically defined soul as a medically explanatory principle. So they have their own moment in history and in thought. As they are fading away by the early 19th century, the kind of minor residual members of their school, so Montpellier Faculty of Medicine, what do they do with explicit political overtones, because there's at this point an emperor in France, they, they say, let's re-spiritualize. So, you know, our, our predecessors of Montpellier Vitalism were great, but they were a little too much on the body, body, body side. We need to insist that the vital principle has a spiritual status, and so it's as if the, to me, the interesting episode of Montpellier vitalism is stuck between two, 
two kinds of soul obsessions. Yeah. Um, and so it just has a very... Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. Because yeah. I'm really glad you fleshed that out. And I hope that there'll be more resonances that sort of unfold. Um, and I, I thought I can't do all that. I want to just give you what I have so I can't do all of the, app, the reception. But what I want to say is one of the things, as you, you pointed out, that vitalism as a kind of historical moment in the, in the 18th century in response to scientific revolution becomes a sort of historiographical strategy and looks and becomes sort of um, downgraded for being archaic. And the problem with that is that even in, in Kangyam, at least especially in the later work, is that Hippocrates becomes the name of this, this um, the, the untaught nature, the wis medicatrix naturae, and you lose the sense that I tried to bring out that actually what we see when we go back to the Greeks is not a kind of archaic before the scientific revolution vitalism, like let's embrace life. Actually, what we see is we see the emergence of something called life or the body, the living body as a problem in this historical record. And what we see is the kind of emergence of the precisely this dialectic that starts to happen. OK, if we go materialist and we need to go back, well, what is that? What is there anything else? OK, there's something else. Wait, what is this other mystical thing? I mean, Galen will say, we all know their soul, but I can't prove that. OK, so what? how are we going to give an account? He invents the idea of the natural faculties as his way of accounting for the kind of imminence of, of mindfulness in bodies that's not exactly soul. So that you see these production of problems, it's not just an oscillation between, you know, sort of I'm in one camp, I'm in the other, but it's the sort of production of a plenitude of conceptual possibilities that become generative in each generation. And that we miss sometimes that the vitalists in the 18th century or in the greco arabic world, I mean, they're reading these texts really deeply. And when they make these strategic strategic claims to the Greeks, from our vantage point, we just think they look archa archaizing, right? They, we look like they're sort of just outdated. We don't realize how much creative work is happening at that moment in going back to a problem that's helping them think through an intervention in the present in ways that aren't trapped in the myopia of whatever that polarization is in the present, where in the, if you're only living in the present, you just see, oh, it's body, oh, it's mind, or oh, it's vegetal life, oh, it's... And instead, what they're doing is they're drawing on like the elaboration or the unfolding of a set of conceptual pop possibilities within this world, and that's what they're using to intervene in the present. So there's something really powerful, I think, about this merger of history and philosophy where you need both sides. Philosophy says, hey, these are resources that help us think right now in the present. That's what historicism gets accused of not being able to do. But on the other hand, for that intervention to be productive, you have to be grounded enough in historical difference so you don't just go to the Greeks to tell you what you already know. And that's classicism at its worst. If I stood up and said, here's what I already think, and Hippocrates said it too. And we can sometimes mistake what the vitalists are doing for that, and I don't think that's what they're doing. They do it it's strategically. OK, this is how I'm going to play this game. But they're actually engaged in a much more robust and creative thinking with these earlier traditions. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Sometimes citations like that are polemical, but other time, uh, but at the same time, it can be substantive in a way that that you would not necessarily think from it solely being. It can be both at the same time, substantive and polemical. So, just uh, I broke my. One rule where everyone uh, let everybody know who they are and where they're from when you're asking a question. So, so, so next question. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm a research fellow at NHGRI, and my question is: Do you have a sense of how these conversations or debates influence the medical practice of the time, or just other things about life in that time period, like the society? No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and in fact, what's interesting about Galen is that he himself is intervening at a historical moment where you have two camps that, that 500 years earlier had sort of um, evolved and both claimed Hippocrates as an heir. And so uh, on the one hand, you had the empiricists who said, you know what, all that research into the hidden interior of the body and the natures that control it and all the, like basically all of research science is just garbage. And what really matters is clinical experience. And all you need to know is like, okay, did that dog have rabies? Yes. Okay. We know this is the outcome if I use this treatment. And the body becomes a black box that's sort of irrelevant. 
um, to the practice of clinical medicine. And so that's the kind of hardcore empiricist line that develops. And then the people who are sort of carrying out what we could see as a Hippocratic inquiry into the body as an object uh, with these hidden powers and hidden space, and you have to know those natures, you have to know the nature of the patient, you have to know the natures of the season, all those things, they become called dogmatists. And so Galen emerges at a moment in the tradition where he says, he, he's, his sort of his brilliance is to say both of these people are crazy. They're too extreme. They're too ideological. I'm going to try to take the best of both worlds. So on the one hand, he invests a lot of um, uh, power and empirical evidence. But on the other hand, uh, there's a great moment where he's doing an anatomical demonstration and, and uh, a skeptic says, uh, stands up and says, well, how can we trust the evidence of the senses? This is a really extreme position. And, and, you know, and he says, you know, of course, uh, of course, you have to trust the evidence of the senses, and we have to trust the, the evidence of reasoning. We have to trust, the, you know, inferential reasoning. So his clinical work is very um, informed by research and anatomical research in particular, and philosophical research. But he's constantly going back to the table of what is this thing on the body, like what is this body, and so and that's where he becomes very interesting because. He's caught between the people who don't believe in medical research, like empiricists, but he's also going to be really critical of the Stoics because he says they don't have any acquaintance with the actual materiality of the body. They haven't done anatomy. They haven't gotten inside. They can't really tell you anything about human nature. So he becomes a kind of interesting moment where you're mediating. So he kind of reminds me, I have to say just one last thing as a kind of modern thing. Um, I think particularly around like um, pregnancy and, and questions around pregnancy, you get these ideological divides between let's do natural and then you have you know the kind of medicalized world and these two camps and they become more and more polarized. And Galen would be the sort of person who comes in and says, yeah, you know, like the body does have ways of, of handling pregnancy. We don't have, you know, but on the other hand, medicine exists for a reason. Uh, and he would be the person who would come in and try to sort of uh, clinically mediate, but also philosophically between those what have become really polarized positions. Okay. So, yes, please. This is a little too tall for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charity. I'm actually, um, I practice clinically as a nurse, but I'm here in the clinic center with the Nursing Research Translational Science Group. And so, you actually, I don't know if you completely answered my question, but your last comment got at what I was thinking about. How do these philosophical philosophical ideals influence what modalities we see as acceptable in Western medicine now? Because like exactly what you were saying, how we have, oh, like more natural birth versus more medicalized interventions. How have you, have you been able to think about how is this influencing what, what we proclaim as healing for a medicalized way versus like other ways different cultures may view healing? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that, I mean, pregnancy is one of those places where you get this question. Um, and natural, I would say a couple things. One is that nature is a concept that we have to get past. It's holding, uh, it's, it's locking us into a very simplistic understanding of what humans are and how they, you know, how normativity works out. Um, and so it allows us to sort of be, okay, medicine versus nature is an artificial opposition. You know, I mean, if pregnancy were natural, like, you know, the chance of dying in childbirth would be high in, in some ways. You know, I mean, so, yes, there are many abuses of medicalization. I mean, I could give you tons of them, but I, I guess my point is, is that nature becomes, a, it's an impoverished concept because it's doing oppositional work to a monolithic notion of medicine. And what's interesting to me is that sometimes the Greek material, the same thing happens in the history of vitalism. People go, oh, you know, we think about Western, non-Western, and then people will make the ancient world sort of analogous to the non-Western and say, well, in the past, we had this very naturalized, you know, Hippocrates, like, let food be your medicine, which is not really a Hippocratic saying. Um, and actually, what, uh, what I wanted to show is, again, it's a, it's a similar way of saying, we never have the emergence of the physical body without these problems of what is the relationship between technique and intervention and the doctor's knowledge, and what is the place of life or the nature of the body or what organizes that. And so that is a debate that gets played out in really interesting ways in antiquity that can help us get past the kind of monolithic nature versus medicine world that particularly obstetrics is, is caught within. Uh, I want to pay attention to the question on this side of the room. So go ahead, please. Um, I'm Ketty. I'm an intern in the policy branch of NHGRI. And um, my question is about Lucretius or I guess Epicureanism, um, from what I understand, Epicureanism and Stoicism are 
kind of like opposite camps or like the different in a lot of ways. I was wondering if you knew if, like what they thought about the soul. And the oh, great. I, I love, I'm an Epicurean by oh. temperament. <laughs> but um, what's really interesting is that on, um, on the, and I was even surprised in my own research recently finding this, that the, the Epicureans are in some ways as invested in the notion of a unity as the Stoics. And so even though you have radically different accounts of how that unity is created, so they're corpuscular theorists, so they're not continuum theorists, um, they still believe that there's something called soul and there's something called body. And they really, you know, so Lucretius in book three of the Durum Natura is this, you know, it's this constant, really interesting discourse for a materialist of tacking between, on the one hand, saying, well, there are atoms and, you know, they could be dispersed at any moment and the body is different from the soul atoms, but they hang together. And the unity is actually really important for an ethical, the ethics of, of Lucretius. I mean, if you have to think about the psychology of Lucretius, this is interesting more broadly. Why does it matter so much that the body and soul create a unity for an Epicurean? Because they really, and sensation is, we didn't talk about that, sensation is a really important site of that unity, because what they really want to insist on is when you die, the unity that was you, the self that was you, that was a knitting together of body and soul is over. So there can be no pain after death and there can be no you after death. And that's the main epi, you know, ethical takeaway for Epicureans because the main, at the end of the day, they're not doing research science. They want you to believe that death is nothing to us. So they've got a different system, but the same commitment to unity. Uh, hey, my name is Noah. I'm a summer student in the NHGRI, and I was just wondering, uh, what do you think is the relevance of learning about these thinkers now that, you know, a lot of them were pretty critically wrong about a lot of their philosophical and medical theories? I mean, Galen's humor is obviously not particularly relevant today, um, and dualism is pretty fraught as a philosophical concept. So, yeah. Well, I mean, the question is, yeah, what's right and what's wrong? So the humors might be wrong, but in a way, their very strangeness to us and soul is the same kind of thing forces us to actually look at the material that looks that might help us get at our own problems from a different perspective. So just to give you an example, I mean, one of the things that, that Galen's thinking about the natural faculties pushes him to do is to think about a division in Aristotle between plant life and animal life. So Aristotle says plants cannot have perception. And Galen is looking at the capacity of plants to distinguish what's appropriate, what's, what can be beneficial, and what can be harmful to them, and can, can figure out, can basically care for their own lives. And he's, re, he's very much opposed to a materialist position, which says attraction, nutrition would all be like a vacuum. He says plants are not like a bellows. They're not like a, a vacuum. They're able to perceive in their environment. Every time I listen to NPR, there's a new thing about how we're thinking about plant cognition again. I mean, there's a place in, you know, there's in Italy, we're thinking about, you know, the, neuro, um, the neuroscience of plants, which is a deliberately provocative term to say, hey, what we thought about intelligence and the brain and perception might be totally wrong because we were locked into a way of thinking about, you know, dualism that actually, if we go back to the ancient material, is mu it's much richer than we had thought. So in a way, if we think they're wrong, it's because we're constrained by our own prejudices and our own sort of failures to think creatively. Uh, and if we really take seriously, and I use that word from, from Eduardo Baveras de Castro, who uses that to think about sort of ontological experimentation. We go to Amazonia and really try to make sense of what does a world look like without a concept of nature? If we really don't start by thinking that's wrong, and we think about how could you organize the world in that way, we may realize that the concepts we've been relying on as like the furniture in the room aren't helping us actually think very well about the world we live in. And, and generally, most dichotomies are polemical anyway. So, um, so okay, so Tana. Oh. Thanks. Hi. Sorry, I, I feel really weird talking to you from the opposite. My name's Tano. I'm one of the workshop participants, a uh, philosopher from Penn State. Um, I just wanted to return to the, I think, maybe one of the first questions you asked, uh, you sort of raised, in fact, which was, do we require uh, the concept yeah. of unity for the thought of life? And um, as your talk developed, you sort of produced the alternative, you know, the kind of materialist uh, no and the sort of holist yes. And just to maybe set up some of the talks that are to come, I wonder maybe what you think in the context of these early uh, discussions of the kind of 
muriological middle ground, which is something like a non fully unified organic body. So thinking maybe in terms of the microbiome, a yeah. kind of muriologically promiscuous organic body and what that might do to these debates, uh, if anything, or that might just be wrongheaded. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I, I find someone like Galen really provocative in that sense. And that's why I included Galen, because in the kind of prestige value of ancient material, which is, you know, in these lar contemporary debates is, you know, here I am, I'm standing up here telling you it's not obsolescent, that Aristotle, people go to Aristotle and say he's our main resource. And Galen's really interesting because, like, he's down there, you know, he's doing experimentation with the body, he's in the clinic, and he has to confront a form of multiplicity, a form of multiple agencies that he can't reconcile with his desire to understand a form of holism. So he's he's constantly navigating. So he is a holist in some ways. He uses this Hippocratic phrase. It's not. It's from a late Hippocratic text, so it's probably influenced by Stoicism. Um, that becomes important to a lot of early modernists, right? That all the parts are in sympathy. And at key philosophical moments, he'll rely on that. And he uses it to describe all kinds of forms. He's committed to teleology. He's committed to the um, synthesis of, say, the nervous system, all the systems. But despite that holism, he's constantly going back again and thinking about these multiple agencies. And I think in Galen's writing, what that produces is a way that says, you know what, that the problem with holism as a practice is that it assumes there's going to be a master discourse. And so, in fact, the body may be a total system, but we're never going to produce a discourse of knowing that's going to capture it in its complexity. So we can do one of two things. We can either pretend we're doing that and get sort of hubristic about it, or we can produce this thing called life, which is always sort of ever beyond. And I think what, you know, that's the opposition I take it. You're trying to get past in some ways. And what Galen is kind of doing is saying, hey, you know, like he talked about the soul. People say, oh, he's very inconsistent ideas about the soul. But, you know, he talks as a doctor. He says, hey, the people who aren't materialists, like, uh, give me your, I'm going to change your diet so you can start thinking better about Platonism. And then in another text, he'll say, you know, like, I lost my whole library in a fire. And I was, everybody's like, Gillen, like, how come you're not so depressed about that? And he does this kind of stoic consolatio thing. And he talks about, I mean, we would look at him and say, he's a research scientist who's going to turn around and write a book about psychoanalysis. And so he sort of recognizes the plurality of discourses that are strategies for knowing something that isn't, that's neither, you know, ephemeral nor totally contained by a technical, you know, a control discourse. Okay. So please go ahead. Hi, I'm Kimia. I'm an intern in bioethics and I study English at Columbia. I had a question about the Homeric um, world that you introduced to us. So you said that the body is usually seen in a dead state. Well, the soma. The soma. So we can't really translate it body, but yeah. But what could the aesthetics of that dead state tell us about, possibly about the psyche or the consciousness? Because we see it, it's surrounded by plants, it's honored in death. What would you yeah. say about that? So I'll, I'll, I could go on forever, so I'll give you a very kind of short answer. Um, the thing that's so cool about the Soma in the Homeric text, which Snell didn't realize, people don't realize, is it's used in cases of bodies that are not recuperated for burial. And so it's the body that could be thrown to, you know, the river. Um, at the really key moment in Book 22 when Hector says to Achilles, if I die, give my body back to my parents. And Aristotle says, I mean, Aristotle, Achilles says, I would eat you raw if I could. And, of course, it foreshadows the fact that Achilles will not give his soma back, that he treats it as something not subject to burial. That I would argue that embedded in soma, and, and I could go on even in some early references, you already have the idea of a, of a form of matter, of human ma of, of contingently human matter, that is itself in a kind of larger material flux, and that burial practices are some ways the early version of the soul. Um, they're a way of repatriating this matter into human meaning and into kind of human life. So it's, it's already a word which bears within it, I would say, in Homer, a sense of what it is in the Hippocratics, which is uh, something that kind of needs care. Thank you. 